Okay, start my stopwatch. I'm conscious of time. I'm conscious that actually I am the nervous eight-year-old um, standing in front of a, uh, this knowledgeable audience. And um, I think the first thing I'm going to do is lose my jacket and become slightly less formal um, and, and perhaps a little more um, a little more relaxed. Thank you to Alt for inviting me back to talk. Although my title's about designing university education, I, I think actually a lot of what I'm going to say applies at least as much in further education and, and to some extent actually um, applies in schools. And it, it comes out of our thinking at the University of Edinburgh about where we go, what's life after MOOCs, and, and those of you uh, who've heard quite enough about MOOCs will be pleased to know that I'm going to talk very little about them in, 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 in this lecture. So, find my next slide. Those of us who've been around a long time, um, and actually it was interesting, 21st um, alt, and because I was just reflecting that this is probably about my 25th year, in technology enhanced learning in a real serious serious kind of sense. Those of us who've been around a long time will probably remember Terry Mays' Groundhog Day, which was a very cautionary tale for us at the time about how every few years, every generation, whatever you want to call it, a new wave of technologies and changes come through and you go, yeah, this is the, this is the big change. This will transform higher education. This will change the way we do education. And the reality was that not that much changed. It wasn't that nothing changed, but there were no substantial radical changes that were promised by those technologies. And so as I go into this talk, I am conscious of, of, of Terry's Groundhog Day. I'm conscious particularly of the enormous amount of actually mostly ridiculous hype that went around MOOCs and, and actually spilled off into other things. And that we have to be quite cautious. And, and also I think that we have to remember that educational change is a slow process. We may like it to be distinctly faster than it is, but it's inevitably in big systems is a slowish process. And therefore patience and persistence is actually probably one of the things that, that's most important for us to bring in. I've got a set of, of fairly simple questions to structure the talk. I'm going to look back about 10 years um, and, and briefly review where we were 10 years ago. Try to, try to sum up where I think we are now and some of the signs that we can see about the things that are changing. And then I'm going to step into the thinking that that's caused us to, to take at the University of Edinburgh about where we might like to be as a university. And actually, although I, my example is the University of Edinburgh, I think that in many respects this is portable across, across almost any university and probably any further education college. I do recognize that schools with their um, circumscribed setting uh, will be somewhat different, but nevertheless, I think some of the lessons there um, are, are also similar. Okay, so where have we come from? That's inevitably a personal view of 2004. I'm not going to step through all of, all, all of those items. But I would sum them up as saying that, that at that point, we'd reached a kind of stability in terms of e-learning tools and systems. And although there were lots of new things coming on, many organizations, many educational providers had got to a kind of stable point at which they were able to build on a, on a sensible sort of base. Um, and there was, I guess, and you could see that symbolized perhaps in the UK, UK university, which of course failed, but in that thinking that somehow digital education, online learning was coming of age, if it had not come of age, and it was possible to think seriously about delivering fully online education internationally. Now, for a mixture of reasons, that... Um, and I think um, the struggle that the European Commission had with the Lisbon strategy, which was, which was um, a strategy to transform and modernize um, education, and perhaps the limited uh, impact that the uh, DFES e-learning strategy actually had, you know, a limited follow-through, um, that actually it was much more difficult than people had hoped to make that big step forward from where we were in terms of embedded use of technology within the campus setting to stepping well outside the campus and offering, offering substantial and, and, and high quality online education. Since that time, we've really seen an explosion in the number of technologies and applications and, and choices, I guess, 
which are available to us. And of course, actually an explosion in identities, because if we step back to 2004, often the VLE or the email address from the university or the college or whatever was your identity to now an explosion of, of, of identities. And a range of tools that have appeared and a range of technologies. And actually, the interesting thing about them is that they were not education-focused, but were standard social consumer products that people brought to their work and to their studies because they were of that kind. You know, these, the utilities that you work with, you study with, but actually they are just part of you and not part of the institution. And I think that that's probably one of the, the, the most important things that we need to remember as we go forward, that it's changes in those sorts of things, and I've got some of them to talk about at the end, it's changes in those sort of things that are likely to have quite a substantial impact on the way we go forward. But I think that over that period of 2004 to now, a couple of things happened, and actually Alt is one of the examples of that, and that was the... the, the um, maturing of networks of people who worked in this area, professionals who worked in this area, um, from all different kinds of settings in every subject you could think of in all sorts of, of, of different roles. The maturing of those networks and a sense of common understanding that this stuff actually, as Christina said, was core to the, to the university or the college business. Um, but also, I think, uh, a real understanding and increasing evidence that fully online could be done at high quality. And, and some, so therefore from that 2004 point at which that was an uncertainty, I would say as we've moved across the 10 years, we've got to the point at which that is a certainty, regardless of whether we as an individual institution do that or not. So, it's always easy to look backwards because you can do that sort of playlist of stuff that's there and you stick it on a slide. It's much harder to do it now um, as, as, as to where we actually are. And, and I realized actually after I'd produced the talk and then I read back through it as trying to rehearse it in my head that I was actually bipolar about it. I was split-brained about it. I've actually got optimistic stuff and I've got pessimistic stuff. I've got glass half full and glass half empty. I'm actually hoping that the glass half full dominates and I certainly want to come back to that at the end. Um, but there is undoubtedly some challenging stuff. A lot of the data that I'm going to talk about is drawn from the U.S., and, and that's not because I think that the U.S. is a, is a sort of the perfect model that, that we will see here if it hasn't, if it hasn't already come, but it's partly that the collection of data is much more extensive in the U.S. than it is here, and I think that's pity, actually. There are questions about why we don't know with the same, uh, with the same certainty um, about ourselves as, as they do across the Atlantic. But I think, actually, the trends that we are seeing in the U.S., we are also seeing here, and they will, undoubtedly, they will undoubtedly come through to us. One of the things that I always watch is Gartner. I like the curvy sort of thing, and it's quite fun to laugh at stuff that's going into the trough of despondency. Um, it's, it's, even, it's even more interesting, actually, to laugh at stuff which is marked, as it is in that bottom right-hand corner, which says obsolete before plateau. And there, there is one item, there's, well, there's one or two items on there that are obsolete before plateau, and, and actually MOOCs, they've got us obsolete even before they reach the trough of despondency. Um, and, and actually, I, in lots of respects, I, I think that that's probably right. Um, but, of course, one of the things about the progression, as we've seen e-portfolios and VLEs and all sorts of things have been through that curve and come out the other end, is actually that most things do come out the other end and do reach a kind of plateau and a stabilization point. They'll be easier to read when you get the slides than they are on the screen. That They do reach a, a plateau and a stabilization point, and some things that become obsolete before plateau actually transmutate into something else. And actually, I think that that, that is probably my optimistic view about, about where MOOCs will go. But we can see a, a steady maturing, maturing in the sense that you can run them at scale and you can run them reliably of all of the kinds of tools that em, em, underpin um, education that we're doing and we can see emergence on that up curve and I've marked badges um, as one of them of the things that actually we do have to watch because they have a potential for significantly shifting 
the way our business is offered, the way we do education, if they come through into a maturity. In other words, we will have to engage with them at that point, curious as they may seem at this point in time. So if we, if we look at some of the studies from the US and some of the data around, it's interesting that the study, and this is an ECAR um, out of EDUCORS um, study of, of American faculty, of, of academic staff within universities and, and, and in colleges, and, and with the usual caveats and skepticism about surveys as to how robust they are and how good a representation they are, the interesting thing about that, and it's, it's now shown quite strongly, is that over the years, the number of academics who have said, I have experience of teaching fully online, teaching online classes. And by online class, they do mean an online class and not just using some technology in class. That has risen steadily. And the number of academics who say that they are familiar with MOOCs doesn't mean to say that they've offered them. It probably means they've been in there for a week or two and, and had a look. But, but that, that does not suggest an audience which is resistant to technology or resistant to change. It suggests an audience that increasingly is getting to grips with, um, that, with that medium. And the motivators down the bottom corner... Um, always release time, design time, de time to do work, and I'll come back to that later. Uh, confidence that it will work, and evidence that students will benefit, and, and I'll come back to that later too. When you look at students in similar surveys, when we take the ECAR survey and look at what students say, interesting again that students are gaining more and more experience of fully online education in some form. It doesn't mean that their institution offers it, but they are getting it from somewhere. And of course, one of the things about, about online education is that your institution may do none, but you are perfectly able to take it. And I thought, interestingly, the very positive view of open education that we can see down there in the corner of the fractions of students who are finding open education resources and the positivity of their view towards those sources. So they're not just looking inward to what their institution is giving them, but they're actually looking outwards. Rather small number of, of, um, of students that say that they've taken MOOCs, but there again, it's a survey that was taken right at the beginning. And Certainly the data we have from repeated iterations of our MOOCs in Edinburgh do show that our young audience is increasing as a fraction of the audience that's taking it. So that initial curve that, that bunched them so much in the adult, in the, in the mid-range adult group, the, the number of younger learners is rising and their purposefulness in there is increasing. And, and it seems to me that's a trend that we are likely to continue to see. And it may be that MOOCs, whether you love them or hate them, will actually be one of the sources of online education experience for, for American students and for our students. If we look at the Sloan surveys um, done by um, Elaine Allen and, and Jeff Seaman over the years, again, we can see a steady increase in the number of students Oops, sorry. A steady increase in the number of students that have actually taken online courses, rising um, steadily over the years. Uh, not a dramatic rise you know, at, at any particular point, but moving steadily upwards. And you could see that a point in, in not too many years' time, that number could be one in five have actually had that kind of experience. And also, I think that in terms of provosts, as they would call them in the US, chief ac uh, academic officers here, that those that come from institutions that offer online view their education as online at least as good, if not better, than that on campus, and that the inferior fraction is quite small. The interesting thing about the, the, the bars below is that those without that experience see it very much the other way around. And so I guess the question will be that if that number steadily rises and those people change their minds, we will again move towards a point at which senior academic officers with institutions actually view online learning as a sensible and a decent thing to do. 
If you look at the general public within the states, and this is the Gallup poll, it's the last of my service from there, there's a caution in it as well as an optimism. The optimism in it is that, is that the view of online net better in terms of wide, wide, wide range of options and good value for money, which is a positive, but there is a sting in the tail on it, and that's this, which is a distinct view there that employers will not trust online education, and indeed that to some degree the assessment of online learners is actually itself inherently suspect and, and weak. And, and so therefore, although there's an increasingly positive view among students and amongst academic staff, there is, I think, and, and, and I think that this has been demonstrated in other areas, that it's not yet the case that it is as good as residential and that it is as trustworthy and as valued is not yet made. Okay, so those, those are the kind of uh, cautionary things. On the other side, if we actually want to look and say, what about the range of tools we've got, then we can see um, an enormous um, explosion of, of, of technologies which are available to us, and they're, they're, they're mapped out in the conversation prism, and I'm sure lots of you have got examples of that, looking at that, at that huge range of tools. So the numbers of things that we might want to do online, the potential for us has risen, and one of the things that's become quite clear to me within my own university over the last year or two is that the focus that we've had in the past about the VLE and the e-portfolio and the assessment systems, in other words, our staff, an obsession I think actually which the European Commission still has, is actually misplaced. I would guess that about 90% of the technology that's used at my university is brought by and used by the students in remarkably creative and remarkably invisible ways. In other words, this is the stuff on which they do their learning. Um, and to a limited degree, it's the stuff on which we do our teaching. And it, it's, it's something that we need to find a way of getting to grips with and, and understanding how to capitalize on, how to ensure that what the students do is uh, valued and recognized as much as the stuff that we do. And also that it's measured because the problem is that the view of us as not using a modern range of technologies is because largely this is actually student-oriented rather than institution-oriented. The next thing that I want to look at briefly then is, is the Horizon Report. And I've watched the Horizon Report over, over a period of years and, and I've always had a degree of skepticism about the timescales. Um, I've always thought that they were overly optimistic. But they do give you a pointer to the sorts of things that you need to watch. And although I think that there's um, not a cat in hell's chance that flipped classroom and learning analytics will actually be adopted in a serious, broad, across, uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, across education way within the next year or less, it is undoubtedly that some of that stuff is on the track now to incorporation and some places have made significant steps in bringing those two in even though uh, for many of us we're still struggling with it. I'll, I'll come back to the two to three years and the four to five years when I get back to the end on my look, look ahead but I think that it's undoubtedly the case that they are right in that these things over the time period that we're talking about here out of about 10 years those things will undoubtedly impact on us as we look forward. So the, the, the dreaded M word, um, and I said there wasn't really going to talk about MOOCs and I'm not particularly, I've only got three rather modest things that I want to say about them. I mean one of which is you've always got to brag about your MOOCs and so I've put pictures of our MOOCs up there. But what was actually interesting was that I was talking to a conference the other day which was about marketing higher education and I reflected on the fact that, that the slickness of the marketing that we do in this space is considerably better than the slickness of marketing we do for our traditional stuff. I wish we marketed our traditional stuff like that. That was actually quite a, a sobering thought when I looked at it. But I think that whether you love them or you hate them or whether you're entirely indifferent to them, MOOCs have, an, have done three things. They have forced open and uh, they've reopened an education, a, a debate at policy level about digital education and what does it mean. And is this going to disrupt our business? How must we change? What do we do about it? Not just what do we do about MOOCs, but what do we do about digital education more broadly? And I think that that 
is an enormously useful debate, and it's one that we must not let close. The other one is it has shown that courses can be run at surprisingly large scale, and they don't fall to pieces, and okay, most of them are pedagogically not exciting, etc. But nevertheless, they do run at very big scale, and surprisingly, they touch learners much more than you might think. Charismatic teachers in the online space can reach their students just as powerfully as they do in a lecture theatre. And indeed, actually, the people who are way up in the back row are as distant, in a sense, from me as, as watching a screen. So we have demonstrated that we can do this stuff at scale. And the other one, I think, is that we are seeing out of the MOOCs a range of technological innovations to say, how could we do this particular thing at scale? How could we form groups automatically? How could we let people select into them? What sorts of tools can we use to, to manage peer assessment? Can we do comparative judgment online in an automated way? There's a range of questions being asked that will result in a whole set of tools and applications which are educationally oriented which we actually, if we look carefully at them and adopt them, will actually find them quite powerful. And I think, therefore, that that set of things that's come out of it are things that we need to capitalise on and, and use as we go forward over the next few years. Okay, so what lessons have we learned? And I think my answer to this one is that the lessons that we've learned are probably hard ones. They're, they're, they're lessons that... that some things we struggle with and, and some things we're unsure how to do. And if you take the page, the next page in the Horizon Report 2014, and we look at those challenges, to my mind, they, they exactly sum up the things that face us. I, I have to say that I, I did have a hollow laugh when I looked at the first one, which said soluble challenges, those that we understand and know how to solve, when it says low digital literacy of faculty, which actually if you go back 10 or 20 years and look at the big issues, it's been there all the way along. And relative lack of rewards for teaching, it's been there for at least 25 years. So it may be one we understand and we may know how to solve it, but whether we can and will solve it is, is, is interesting. And, and I, again, I shall come back to, to some of that as, 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 as the... Um, as, as the points that, that I want to close on at the end. But those are the challenges that face us. They sum it up quite neatly. How do we transform our business? How do we shift into new ways of doing things? Particularly, how do we scale teaching innovations? How do we get them to scale so that they run right across our institution rather than them being bijou and niche? So I want to just... No, actually, I think I've changed my mind. I'm going to skip those. I shall run too short of time. You get all the slides, so. So, I was struck looking at this quote from Bill Bowen, who's a very respected higher education um, economist in, in, in the US, who gave the Tanner lectures, which are definitely worth reading in, in Stanford um, a couple of years ago. And he sums up, I think, one of the challenges that we, we have to face as a, um, as, as a community in that the technologies that we've used have mostly been focused on enhancing the quality of the existing things that we do, of improving what we do, but not particularly focusing them on changing the economics of, of, how we, of how we offer education. And I think, interestingly, one of, the, one, of the, one of the outcomes that we have seen from MOOCs is a direct experiment in can you change the economics of, of the way that you do it. But, but one of the things we must have an eye on, because it won't come accidentally, is can we find ways to use this range of technologies and to use the range of, 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 of knowledge that we've gained to increase either the throughput of students, and one of those I would, I would say, and this is challenging, is 
is you move through the curriculum at your own speed rather than the speed that I define it. So if you can learn it by the middle of October, you don't have to wait till the exams at the beginning of December, which is a very traditional kind of model. Or some parts of the curriculum you can scale to much larger. And so instead of a large class being 400, a large class could be 4,000, which is actually abnormal in, in, in this UK and, and European education. Purposefully using education to try to address that question of how do you increase the productivity of education as a system without a decline in the quality. And I think that unless we have some eye on that, then we do run a risk of polishing the current system and making it better, smoother, more 21st century without addressing a fundamental question of access on a large scale, global access on a large scale, um, without, with, with our current limited funds. I, it was interesting that, and it's the slides before, but I won't talk too much about those, we posed this question to a set of people across Europe who were in communities like yours and asked them about what technology might do. And this was one of the things, increase the productivity of the system. And the thing that I was perturbed by about that was that most of them hated the idea and found that what they really wanted was to increase the quality, perhaps increase access a bit, but increasing productivity was not something that was in their, in their um, um, vision, if you like, looking forward. And so, although I'm conscious that this is a rather unpalatable economic view, actually I think that it's one that we as institutions and, and we as individuals with institutions need to consciously think about and, and to test. Okay, that, that's the end of the pessimistic bit. I'm now going to move into the sort of optimism out to 2025 and, and, and all that wild stuff. Um, and so the question really is, what do you want to look like in 2025? And indeed, this was one of the questions that we were posing for the European Commission. Um, and actually, we posed to them, and to which they had no answer, well, if, if it's all going to be modernized by 2025, what will it look like? And to which they had no answer. And indeed, actually, to which many people, I, I think, in reality, don't have an answer. I think it's important that we do have an answer. That when somebody says, what will university or college education look like, there is an answer, as, as my PhD, very first PhD supervisor used to say to me, if you can't explain it to your grandmother or your grandfather in a minute or two, you don't know what you're doing. And in a sense, that's what I'm saying here. So that's my list. That's, that's how it would be to me. An education system that was on demand, in other words, you could take it when you wanted to and not when you didn't. That was self-paced so that you could move at the speed which was appropriate to you rather than being lockstep down. That was location flexible so that you could be in residential or you could be out, you could be in today, you could be out tomorrow. Relevant relevant to, the, to your future and not just relevant to the immediate employer's needs, that is global and local, because I think that, that all, of our, all of our graduates should have that global international view, personalized to your learning place, style, speed, affordable always, and that actually goes back to my question before about, about productivity and, and efficiency, and high value added, in other words, you don't just come, you don't come in and go out with nothing particularly added to it. And actually it is interesting that there are studies going on at the moment trying to work out um, to what extent um, education is value added. And inevitably, of course, across a wide range of subjects, so this just isn't just about business and the professions, it's about the humanities and the social sciences. That's not about technology. The word technology doesn't appear, but it does seem to me that to reach that point without systematic application of technology, it is undoable. And so therefore, the technology that we use must underpin that vision. And the question for us is, what's the roadmap? How do we get there? And I, 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 I confess here to being a horribly kind of top-downish person in my thinking, and so I'll, I, I apologize for that at the start. But I do think that without a vision 
at policy level, and policy level actually means government and it means the VCs and all of that, and the MOOC discussion box that was opened, that discussion at policy level, and that formulation of a vision at top level, without that, the system will not transform. And you need a roadmap of purposeful steps, but they are modest. But 2025 is 10 years away. And so unless one actually knows with planning rounds that run every year or every three years, however you do them in your university, if there are not steps written into that roadmap, you, we, I will get to 2025 and will not have made any progress. So we are talking about roadmap that has steps for next year, the year after, the year after, out to 2025. And beyond that, I don't know. But unless they are planned in, they will not happen systematically across the board. It does require investment. I, we see signs that recession is easing. I know that money is tight. But this is a strategic decision about investment into the future. And it's got to be done with an agility, and that means one's got to be prepared to adapt and change and, and, and perhaps pick up MOOCs or child of MOOCs or whatever comes next. That one's got to have an agility within it um, to be able to, to pick up on things as they change, determination, as I said, and analysis and evidence base. Is this actually changing the quality? Is this actually cheaper? There are some quite hard things there for us to, to look at. So I'll talk for a few minutes about my view for Edinburgh. And I've said my view, uh, and I'll say our view and my view. Um, it, it's, it's a kind of Edinburgh view, but it's actually a lot of it is my view. But I don't find people who are disagreeing with me, so maybe it's our view. So the question is, so the question is where are we now? So this is 2013, and, 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 and so I did, this, I did this a year back for, for a talk. Actually, as we were beginning the MOOC stuff, and I've updated it a bit since. 30,000 learners on campus. So we are a very, very residential university, and as it shows on there, technology runs all the way through everything that we do. So we've got VLEs and ePortfolios and all that stuff. Technology is everywhere throughout it. And then off campus, we have 50 odd fully online master's degrees. So this was our step into the fully online space, was to choose master's level education and not undergraduate education as the ground in which we would do this. We've got about two and a half thousand students now and rising steadily. And we've been doing that actually now for almost 10 years since we, we introduced our first ones. And then the tiny little thing, the MOOCs, are just one small proportion of the university's business despite the huge publicity and noise and, 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 and all of that's gone around them. And at 2013, we had six MOOCs, we had 300,000 learners, I call them. Of course, most of them came and, and didn't really learn all that much, but nevertheless, you know, they enrolled and they did what they wanted to do, and, 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 I, and I, I don't really worry about that. And we had, um, we've now got to, to 15 MOOCs, um, we've hit 800,000 that have enrolled and, 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 um, and, and looked at and taken to some degree our MOOCs, and we're building about another 15 as it stands. So, but it's still a modest kind of part of our business. And then, curiously, and I reflected on this when I talked to Lifelong Learning Association a while ago, we have about 17,000 people who are enrolled on our continuing education programs, and actually their use of technology is close to zero, which is kind of curious, and they sit out in, in, a, in, a, in a side space. So that's where we are at this point in time. We made that strategic decision that off-campus was where we were going to go, and we made the decision that it was going to be at master's level, and then within that offline space, we made that decision that we would move to MOOCs. So where would we be 2020 plus? Well, the big shift is that on-campus has now become on-campus and off. We would reach a point, and probably our student numbers will have grown, but nobody would graduate from the university who had not taken one fully online course in any degree. 
and that means all of the undergraduate degrees. And when I say one fully online course, I mean one core fully online course, not just a peripheral optional extra course. And that all of our faculty, all of our teaching staff, would have some experience of teaching fully online. That we would grow our off-campus to around 10,000 master's students. And at that point, we have 10,000 on campus, we have 10,000 off campus, we are 50-50 at master's level as to whether they're on or off. And actually, in truth, they will probably begin to blur. And people will say, I'll take that module on campus and I'll take that module online. So, and gradually entering into online doctoral space. But this changes this and this changes our university business. Open, I've dropped the M off MOOCs, and they're now called OOCs, because I don't think they'll be massive. But there will be open online courses. Whether they're offered through platforms, or whether we float courses free of our VLEs to become open to be taken, it, it remains to be seen. But we would move into offering open education on a significant scale, increasing the number of open educational resources, and perhaps reaching tens of millions of learners who had accessed and used our educational materials. So open has become a core part of the business. And for many of these courses, this is some of the experience that the faculty would get. And then finally, we bring all of that continuing education inside the technology fold. I've added rich to it, because I think that over this period of time we will enrich that. And this then, this model of the university, will have shifted the way we do our business significantly so that online is truly embedded in every student and every um, academic's experience. So how do you get there? And I'm mindful of the things that were in the Horizon Report, of the difficult challenges, the things that we find it hard to change. And so I think that purposeful and modest experiments and pilots and tests that are designed always to scale is the route that is my preference. And I offer on here a set of different things that one could decide that in any given university one wanted college, one wanted to do, and do so that you knew you were looking at that so that you could blow it up to scale. It would not be an experiment that would remain in a particular location. It would be an experiment that would scale across. And, and a clear example and you can see it up there in the top corner, which addresses that question of, um, of, of academic skills and also of student skills, is really doing digital literacy for all in a real systematic and programmed in way, expanding instructional design, the US expression, learning technologies, if you like, people who understand pedagogy, and embedding that and working for scale, building online courses, testing remote assessment and remote invigilation so that you could scale it across the university, trying learning analytics in a set of courses or programs, but knowing that this is going to go university-wide, that doing those serious experiments with an eye to scale from the beginning is the way that one will introduce the kinds of core elements that it's needed to achieve that vision which I set out at the beginning. But you've got to watch things on the way, and I had the word agile sitting in, um, sitting in the slide earlier. And a short while ago, I, I had to talk to our senior management team about the technologies that would impact education as you look to 2025. And so I tried to think of the sorts of things that we might see coming in that we could not ignore and would need to take account of as we plan this set of experiments and as we plan this roadmap ahead. And, and this is my set of slides compressed down into one. And, and it is, of course, this is the techie bit. Top of the list was security. 
which, which I see acutely in the university now every day. Uh, top of the list, we will have to address the question of security. And then there'll be stuff that we know about, but, but don't necessarily know what the impact will be. The ubiquity of fast internet, although as Christine said, we have to watch the access thing. Mobile everywhere, but wearable. Actually, there are questions that come from priv about privacy, etc., that come out of wearable. And the Internet of Things, consumer devices and instrumentation. Actually, I saw a beautiful talk the other day from somebody talking about the Internet of Things and putting sensors on everything, and they did it on toilet roll holders. And the interesting, the intrusion of privacy that you get from knowing how a toilet roll holder is used was really quite jaw-dropping. So some of this stuff, some of this stuff will be very uncomfortable. For us. And we will have to think of policies as well as the technologies. Semantic web, ubiquitous information, find and digitize. Intelligent agents, things that come in. You can see this being trying to be coded into the MOOC space. How can we do this automatically, intelligently? How can we code a way, a way of doing this? A data-driven world that includes learner analytics, and that's got enormous privacy questions around it. An on-demand compute so that students can compute with big data sets at will as they choose. And personalization, a, a sense of, of those models that it's for me. And then down in this bottom left-hand corner, I think a set of hard technologies that, that we will see coming through that might transform some of the ways that we think about language, some of the ways that we think about, about, um, about text and, 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 and speech, etc. Video audio becoming easier than text. How, how will your rooms cope with video audio easier than text? Speech recognition and real-time translation so that maybe English is no longer the dominant language or actually its importance begins to diminish. It's less of an issue on campus. Digital physical co-presence, I mean, we, um, Christina mentioned the bringing students together and having that, but if you could do, and the slide there is Princess Leia in Star Wars, if you could just beam in so that you had a real sense, or alternatively, you wear the headsets that give you um, the real view, we might move from a paucity model of not being here to an equality model of not being here with being present, Social internet, and then one that at the bottom that I'm sure will come, and I just don't quite know what it will mean for us, but we are beginning to experiment with them, and that's the 3D printer. Um, so a set of things, I think, that over the next 10-year period, we will see those coming through in some form or another, and our agility must be to catch on those and pick up on them and work out how to interweave them into the education that we offer. So I am optimistic. I am conscious that 25, uh, 2025 we could be saying, uh-uh, it's just another Groundhog Day. I think that there are significant changes this time around. The socialization of technology, the increasing comfort with doing stuff online has changed the possibilities for us from where we were 10 years ago, from where we are, I, I, I think, even now. The opening of the box, the discussion about education and online that, that MOOCs have caused and an increased interest at, at political and policy level has opened a door for us to be able to step through it if we act in a purposeful way, to step through it so that 2025 is distinctly different, so that the higher education we offer has actually been transformed and is perhaps fit for at least the first half of the 21st century. Thank you very much for your time. Um, thank you for listening. I shall be around for the next uh, day and a half or so, so I'm happy to chat to anyone when we're there. Thank you, Jeff. That was a very inspiring talk. You've given us lots of ideas. You've covered a lot of ground there, and we now have time for questions. Now, as always, as you know, we have a fair number of colleagues who are contributing to the conference online, and we'll be happy to take questions too from our virtual delegates to the conference. If you're in the hall, please raise your hand if you have a question, and we do have roving mics, and if you wait until the mic comes to you, we'll then allow everyone to hear your question, whether they're here or whether they're listening in online. So, I'll open the floor for questions. 
There's one up here. There's another one up here. Okay. Uh, I think we'll start with this one. Hello, Jim Harris from the University of Northampton. Um, extremely interested in the fact that there was a, an underlying feeling of what we can do to influence policy rather than simply we're just in, introducing new technology. One of the biggest problems that we've had is what we, what we term cave dwellers, colleagues against virtually everything. <laughs> do, you, do you believe that there will still be people living in a cave in 2025? Um, I... I, I try to avoid using words like resistant to change and Luddites and all that, particularly Luddites because it's historically wrong, but, but resistant to change. I, I, I tend to try to take a more uh, generous view, I suppose, and, and that's that, that people who teach are cautious of change that might result in um, an educational experience that fails or is damaging. In other words, big experiments you avoid, and, but small experiments you might do. Um, unsupported experiments and explorations you are even more wary of than, ex, than, than supported and, and, and assisted. And that's why I think that one of the things that we've actually got to find a way of doing, and this is a policy decision for institutions, is scaling up the amount of pedagogical and technological support that there is for faculty. Because I don't believe that I don't believe there are very many who truly are cave dwellers in the pejorative sense that that word's meant. I think that the vast majority are agnostic or are cautious or are wary or actually quite realistically are time limited. And the question is how can you remove those challenges from those individuals and then you, you will always be left with very, very late adopters, non-adopters. Um, and, and the answer to them may be that that it, with time they will disappear. But I think that, but I'm, I'm optimistic in the sense that I think the number is small. I, my experience is that the number of people who are prepared to experiment with the right support are quite large. And actually what was interesting is if you, if you look at the universities that have experimented with MOOCs, you see that absolutely, that people who have never done online stuff before have come forward and said, I would like to do one. And the reason is that they know they will get good solid support to do it. And so the question is, how can one do that, even for the, the sort of the bog standard within the university teaching setting? And, and a lot of this comes down to capacity in terms of instructional design or, or learning technology, I think. And that does cost money. It, so it does require an investment, I think, to help that happen. Yes, our first online question uh, comes from John Cooper, who's the editor of Virtual Training World. Uh, he asks, do you see any evidence that digital education is providing an opportunity to reach out and provide bridges to employers and industry, uh, e.g. reaching out to students on work placements or bringing lecturers in from industry? Um, well, it, it clearly has the potential. I think whether, whether institutions do that or not varies a lot. It, 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 is, it is clear that in the MOOC space, for instance, employers are interested in this and there are conversations going on about building um, online courses and whether they are MOOCs with an M, I don't know. But building online courses that employees can take that employers can send them to and we have certainly had conversations within Scotland within with small to medium enterprises and these are the most challenged of all in terms of training who actually now I suppose because they have seen the discussions about online learning and they have seen universities begin to offer this kind of uh, this kind of activity which is, they've not before have actually seen a, 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 an opportunity to come forward and say well actually maybe some of the stuff that you might design might be useful to us I think that you can also see an increasing range of professional development courses being designed and offered, which clearly will be of value to employers. Uh, and, and there are lots of examples around where I think employers are engaged as teachers in online courses. We have some within, within our university. Uh, I mean, they're employers or professionals you know, within the working profession. Who are, who are teachers on the courses. I, I mean, the opening up of the, the, the boundaries of space and time, the constraints which the campus normally has, 
uh, and which uh, most employers find most challenging, I, I think that as one moves more and more into online education, we will see more and more people doing that. Of our master's students on our 50-odd master's courses, almost all of them are part-time and working full-time. <laughs> Thank you, Will Burroughs, OCR. In terms of your OOCs, what is the business model for building and providing them? Are you charging for them or are you making them, uh, by open do you mean anybody can access them at no cost? And, and how are you sustaining the business and protecting yourself or, or is this, or are you not, you're just Building, it, uh, you know, building a business separate to it, if you like. Um, well, if you look at what we do with MOOCs at the moment, those, those are offered completely free of charge, so you take them at, at no charge, and it's a standard freemium model, if you like, that if you wish to have the value-added optional extras, and they are optional extras, then you can buy them. I think in the, open, in the open education space, actually some of our learning comes from what the Open University did with OpenLearn. And that is that is that if you if you wish to enable, and I think that this is an important uh, element of of university openness, if you wish to enable people to see what kind of an education you offer, then offering open courses gives them one way of getting an insight into what it would be like to come to you. Of course, the problem at the moment is that if you take an online course and you come to do a residential course, they're chalk and cheese. And so the residential courses would need to become more technology rich and, and your online courses would need to reflect um, more, uh, a, a, a more sensible representation of what it would be like to come. But nevertheless, it's a, it's a way of looking and seeing what a course would be like by trying it and taking it, and some of those people may come through and then they become fee-paying students in some way, whether government pays for them or whether, whether they pay for themselves. And that's obviously directly relevant in our online master space. Uh, at the present time, the open courses that we offer uh, are sitting in a different space to our um, degree courses. And the question is, how do you bring those closer together? How do you take the material that you're building for your on-campus courses and offer them out without any significant additional cost because you have already built them, so they aren't necessarily expensive? And indeed, some of that would be pro bono. You know, it's for the world and, and, and it's about outreach and it's part of our mission. And as long as it's not economically um, too imbalanced in terms of ex excessive cost, we do that kind of stuff all the time anyway. We do knowledge exchange, etc. And it, no money changes hands. So it fits into this, into this space of, of normal university activity, some element of recruitment, some element of charge services on top, and as long as the balance economically looks about right, then it's, a, it, it's, a, it's part of our normal business. Do you, do you see it near a point where you are competing? Yeah, we don't have the microphone. No, I, well, I'll repeat it. Yeah, the question was, does, does do, do residential and online go head-to-head -head in competition with each other, in a sense? No, they're different activities. Um, I mean, it, it's, you are reaching... You are reaching, in the pure state, with, with the fully online and the fully residential, you are talking to different audiences. Our fully residential master's programs are almost entirely populated by non-working, full-time learners. Our online master's courses are almost entirely populated by full-time working adults. So you're talking to different populations. In the middle, as you hybridize those, you will actually talk to people perhaps who are working but could take time off or do want to come to you but actually need to be away some of the time. And so therefore they're complementary businesses and as long as you can allow them to overlap so that people can make the right choice for them at the right time, you maximise the flexibility in terms of the audiences you can reach. So we, we just see them as different forms but of equal quality. Two questions here. There's one just behind the bar, and I'd like to first and then we'll come to you. 
Okay, thank you. Um, Jeff, thank you for a tremendously awesome. wide-ranging talk. I'm here oh, right. looking for where I was. Um, and, and lots of really good insights, and one of those I thought was the, um, the importance of understanding the true cost, getting the business model right, understanding how to make it productive, education truly productive and therefore affordable. And I thought you, you I mean, it seemed to me that, that universities have always not understood the true costs of teaching, whether it's conventional or it's, it's digital. Mm. And once MOOCs arrived, I thought that just reached out a scale of idiocy. And you nailed that really well when you said, look at how we market MOOCs, which are free, when we don't even market the stuff which we charge a lot for. It's quite remarkable. Mm. So that is so important, that being able to, to figure out how we make it affordable. And quite rightly, the idea of everybody thinking it's going to get cheaper as we can get students with 4,000 watching one lecture. But that's the easy bit. That's the fixed costs of teaching. And the really tough part is how we support and nurture the students through their personal intellectual development. And that's where the one-to-one -one comes in and where the, the, the small student numbers comes in. So the question is, how do we get the technology to support us in that sort of process. Do you um, see ways forward? Yeah, I, I do. And, and actually, my answer to that, my answer to that is, is that I'm not sure that... I'm, I, th I think the answer may be in the middle. Uh, I mean, we know that if you can give a lecture, you know, you put it on you, you know, iTunes U and, and a million people can watch it together. So we know that the lecture, the presentation, scales enormously. And you can break it up into short pieces and it's more pedagogically sensible and all that stuff. It still scales. And then at the other end, you need... Um, varying degrees of, of personalised support, and you're right, it's the one-to-one -one or the one-to-a-few. The question to me is, is there something in the middle where we could find intelligent ways, and this means technology intelligent ways, of doing that at the kinds of ratios that we run our MOOCs. Our tutors are 1 to 10,000. So the question is, can we find technologies that will help us do some parts of our educational business that way? So we're not trying to automate everything, because something's unautomatable, but some things might be automatable. Some things actually, and MOOCs have certainly taught us this, some things might be crowdsourceable, scalable, and with the technology support for them, that might mean that you can step away because it is quite interesting how much you can step away from, from online courses. And with a well-engaged student group and a well-structured task, a lot of that runs with very little from you. But, but you need to know when to step in. And when you look at very large discussion forums, you need to know where to focus your attention. So if the technologies help you manage those learnings that are going on at scale, maybe that's where the economies come. And you retain the expensive small group for where you need it. You use the bulk where it works. But somewhere in that middle, one might actually be able to find new areas in which the economies of scale are really quite significant. And so it seems to me that, that, it, that some of the exploration that is going on at the moment around MOOCs, around managing big groups and building tools that dashboard and help you see where to go and what's going on, and semantic analysis is part of that, that it... If we can find some ways of doing that stuff, you may be able to look after a lot more students simultaneously than you, than you would normally do. And, and so that, that, to my mind, is where, where one would put the focus. I wouldn't bother trying to find smart ways of doing um, the stuff that actually does need an individual. It, it's too likely to fail. Uh, in the end, I don't know, 50 years from now, it may be very different, but, but 10 years from now, not. Thank you. Um, I'm here. Sorry. I'm uh, Ava Lehman, and I'm a Deputy Vice-Chancellor of a university, so I think about these thoughts that you presented, and I have done that for about 20 years like you have. Now, you talked about your 2020 vision, 2025 vision. You talked about purposeful, and I think you said modest steps. As we both know, you need to make some leaps from time to time. 
If you could indulge for a moment and think that you are the Vice Chancellor at the University of Edinburgh, what would be the couple of leaps, one or two leaps that you would invest in at this point in time to get to your 2025 vision, which is probably even greater than the 2020? Hmm. Well, I mean, some of it's underway already, which is the expansion of, of online master's degrees, and, and that's, that's a growing track, so we've already made that, that jump. And, and that, you know, that was a significant investment of, 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 of real folding money. And actually, interestingly, to go back to what Diana said, uh, there were real financial as well as academic business cases associated with every one of those programs we developed. So that was one of the other steps, was to understand costs a lot better. Um, I mean, to my mind, it, and it goes back to the cave dwellers, um, real serious folding money investment into instructional design, educational design, or learning designers, whatever you want to call them, we just need a lot more. And they need to work as a coordinated team. And, and although they may belong to the academic units, they need to work as a team because otherwise you don't get the systematic. Um, so that's one. Um, more attention to online assessment, which is, I think, has languished for quite a long time and, and actually when you look at the sort of stuff that's now out in MOOCs, you know, true false MCQs and you think, oh no, no, we got beyond that decades ago. You know, so to really to really begin to move to move into that kind of space. Um, I, I think that learning analytics it's an uncertain thing, but it does seem to me that increasing amounts of data about what your learners are doing and how they learn will help them. And, and some of that actually merges into adaptive learning. In other words, it actually shows you where you are and what you need to do. And I think that, that is, that's a possibility um, for scaling um, right across the institution. Um, so so I, I guess that those would be, my, would be my top ones. MOOCs doesn't really feature in that. Um, I'm glad to say it, it sort of sits out, sits out on the side. Um, and, it, you know, there will be uh, games, for instance, and VR is not one of those that is, as it happens is on, is, is on my list. Um, those, to my mind, would probably be the main, the main sort of areas for adventure. And I think that you're right that I have said modest because, I, because, I mean, it, you can't go from here to university-wide. But modest actually can be quite significantly impacting Actually, I, I think I would also add fully online, fully online courses for undergraduate students, which is quite a significant step for us and will require a real mental shift. Um, so they've got, they have to be modest, but they have to have impact and be significant, is, I suppose, is really what I should have said. Thanks, Jeff. I'm Nigel Ecclesfield. I'm on Alt's Further Education Committee. So this is a question about your vision of the technology changing the universities doesn't seem to indicate that the university itself, in terms of its position within the education system, is going to change. It's almost as if the university is the superset and the rest of the system is there to follow the, the lead from, from universities. I'm concerned that in current developments in schools, learners are being taken away from technology back into rote learning. We have an FE system which is responding to employers, but also their communities. And I was hoping that you'd, you'd address some of those issues in your talk this morning, because I think for me in 2025, what we're looking at as a university may look very different from the uh, traditional institution and its kudos and creed that we have than the ones we have today. Um, yeah, I, 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 I take your point. I'm always very wary about, about, telling, about um, telling people what they should do when my knowledge base is not adequate to help do it and and so although although I did talk about universities I think actually many of the things that I've talked about are equally applicable in the FE settings and for instance uh, virtual workplaces and those interactions maybe fully online courses etc so so I mean I, I I I feel confident to 
to, in a sense, suggest to universities where they might go, I feel less confident to do that for FE. I, I'm actually part of the Scottish government's group to design digital education for schools, and I am very aware of, of how different the school setting is. And, and therefore, trying to say things about how that should be runs across a very different set of, of, of issues. You know, the curriculum, for instance, is not, you are not free in, in those settings to decide what you will or won't do in the same way as you are within, within universities. Um, local authorities make decisions about access policies, about bring your own device, etc., which can vary. You know, you can cross a street and, and you've gone from accepted and welcome to denied. Um, so, so the settings in, in where there's much more local control, the challenges there, and actually I think the, the opportunities are different to the university setting. Uh, I, it doesn't mean to say that I don't think some of this isn't relevant, and it doesn't, certainly doesn't mean to imply on my part, and I'm sorry if I did, that universities were everything and so the rest of the education sector followed suit around it because I don't think that that, that that is true at all. But in some respects, the sorts of vision that I think that, that I would have for my own institution of much more open, open on the boundaries, and engagement with colleges, as we do engage with Edinburgh College, for instance, which is the amalgamation of the local FE colleges, and we, as we engage with our access courses that bring learners from more disadvantaged backgrounds in, everything we do in this area assists that and doesn't damage it. Uh, and indeed, some of the stuff that we are doing, for instance, around MOOCs and around open education, is specifically designed to help widening participation and access and is designed to help engagement with, 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 the, with the colleges. But I think unless the university itself has got a vision about it, its place and what it wants to do and where it wants to go, it's much harder to have those conversations with other organisations and if they don't have a vision about where they want to go, then you wind up in this kind of mishmash in the middle. Uh, I think that it's better if people have got clarity and then you look for where you overlap and where you can achieve common purpose. Well, thanks, Jeff, for that very stimulating uh, start to our conference. There's lots of topics there to think about, and I hope you'll be able to take some of those forward over the next few days. But could you join me again before we go to say thank you to Jeff Haywood? <laughs> so, just a quick reminder that it's not quite lunchtime yet. <laughs> We do have our parallel session starting.